pray. Heavenly Father, bless us as we reflect together on your word. Grow us as a church. Grow us in your love, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, Jesus was always arm-wrestling the religious people of his day. They thought religion was an outside-in thing, and Jesus thought true religion was inside-out. I wonder what you think. What matters more, inside, outside-in or inside-out? I think there's a movie called Inside Out, but... It looks to me like it's Disney, so I avoid movies like that. It's getting much harder to avoid Disney movies, though, because they're buying everything. But uh, I will just stick by my guns. I, not, not a Disney fan, sorry. Uh, but I've heard it's a good movie, actually. My kids like it. In Malachi's time, the externals are good. They look good, but there's something wrong. There's something kind of lukewarm about the church in Malachi's time. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. So it's interesting because we get to see how God chooses to close what we call the canon or the table of contents of the Old Testament. And after Malachi, there's three or three or 400 years of prophetic silence until the arrival of John the Baptist who prepares the way for Jesus. In fact, Malachi ends with a prophecy about John the Baptist coming, so that that links the Old and New Testaments really nicely. But if if all you care about is appearances, then maybe you might have been happy in Malachi's time. It's about 450 BC. They've been brought back from from exile. That was a tough time when the Babylonians, who were kind of like the, the Disney company of the day, took over and uh, took them out and took them into exile and destroyed their city, destroyed their nation. But now they're a new nation. Now they've been reborn, resurrected by God's mercy. And we know from Ezra, they have the most important part of their city is the temple, and that's up and running. And we know from Nehemiah earlier this year, they've built the walls of Jerusalem, so they have security. So they're really actually going well on the outside. Um, they're worshipping, and they've, they seem to have learnt the lesson which really was a problem for most of the Old Testament of false idols, worshipping other gods. God says, don't have other gods but me. I'm the true and living God. But they kept bringing in idols from other nations. They don't seem to have that problem anymore. That seems to be pretty much sorted out. But So what's wrong? Well, if you read Malachi we find that they are lukewarm. They're half-hearted. They're not, they're not full-on disobeying God, going, going off, the, off the rails, but they're not full-on loving God. They're not passionately obeying God. Their worship is limp. You know, they're, they're not confident of God's love. They present, instead of the best sacrifices, they give their, their leftover animals and their and their crappy animals to the temple. Their leaders, their pastors, their priests uh, teach poorly and have bad example. And so that's no good. Um, Their marriages, we find, are crumbling. And they are wearying God in their lukewarmness. Uh, Their their financial giving, their tithing, that's a bit of an indicator of health, is terrible, Malachi says. They distrust God. They speak against God again and again. Could these accusations, these charges be brought against Berwick Anglican Church, 1015 congregation? Well, we need to discern that together. Malachi is our doing business with God for the next five or six weeks. And the most important question that Malachi starts with in all his grading of their different kind of... um, weak discipleship um, characteristics, number one is this. They've forgotten God's love or they don't even appreciate God's love. But hear the word of God through Malachi to his people. Hear this oracle this morning. What does God bring to us through this uh, book of the Bible? God says to us, 
I have loved you, says the Lord. I have loved you. And here at Back, we, we, uh, we love the Bible and we encourage people to read the Bible. And you will know this is not the, I'm being so facetious. This is not the first time God's love is mentioned in the Old Testament. We don't believe the caricature that the Old Testament is bad. The Old Testament, a major theme of the Old Testament is the love of God to his covenant people. Give you a little few little snippets. These are wonderful. Moses is meeting God at Mount Sinai and asks to see God's glory. And God reveals his glory in a self-description of who God is. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands of generations, I think that is, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. God loves his covenant people. Or even when they were in the thick of the Babylonian exile, when they got taken over uh, by Disney and, you know, there was a horrible time, there's a book that sounds depressing called Lamentations, but in the centre of Lamentations is this delightful worship song. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What a great lesson to learn in suffering, that God's love and faithfulness are new every morning. God loves his covenant people. Well, think of the Psalms. In the Old Old Testament, the Psalms are kind of a a book of love songs, uh, mainly about God's love for us as well as our love for him. But think of Psalm 136, quite a long psalm. I'll just give you a snippet. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. Every second line of that psalm is his love endures forever. What a great book they had, the law and the prophets and the writings, declaring the love of God to his covenant people. And in the, not just in the words of God, but in the actions of God, it was love that made God choose Abraham and promise him that he would become a great nation. It was love that brought them out of Egypt through Moses. It was love that brought them into the promised land. It was love that made them a great nation with a great kingdom. And it was love that brought them out of exile and made them a nation again, resurrected as a nation. God loves his people. Even the name, the, the all caps, Lord, the divine name, it, the, it's, it's evocative of the God who made the covenant with his people, the God who loves his people, and covenant itself is a, is a marriage image. You know, God loves his people. He's in, a, he's in a covenant with them. So let me just role play Malachi now. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Do you know what I mean? Like, I, had, I was practicing how hard could I hit myself with a Bible? <laughs> how have you loved us? Do, do, you, do you feel the sense of sulkiness, of rebellion in that? Really, God? Have, really, have you? Really? Oh, right. I didn't know. You know, like, how, how could you say that? You can see the, the lukewarmness amongst God's people They have not cherished God's love. They have not delighted in God's love. And when you, when you become, let yourself, when you don't discipline yourself in the word to grow in God's love, to thank God for his love, when you don't worship with vigor and celebrate the love of God, what happens? You become like these guys. They are sulky, cynical, self-centered, murmuring, self-pitying, angry at God. Friends, you have a duty to nourish your sense of the love of God every day. You have a duty to sing and delight in the atonement that Jesus would die for you. You know, you have a duty to worship with focus and to work hard against the distractions that are all all on us to celebrate God's love. Don't be like the church that Malachi is addressing 
Well, how will Malachi prove God's love, or how, how will God prove his love? Well, it's surprising. God says through Malachi, here's the evidence. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, the Lord says, yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated, and I have turned his mountains into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Some background here. When you, if you go back, wind back 1500 years to the patriarchs of the Old Testament, Abraham and his son was Isaac, and Isaac, um, among others, had a wife called Rebecca, and they had a child called Jacob. So Abraham, Abraham Isaac, Jacob. But um, with with Jacob, though, he's a twin. And in Rebecca's tummy, she's feeling very pregnant with her twins. And God sort of says to her in Genesis 25, it may feel big, but it's actually bigger than you realize. Two nations, Rebecca, are in your womb. Two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. It's, very po- it's a very potent time of history. And of these two twins, they will both become great nations. And the twins were Esau and Jacob. They're even fighting in her tummy, in her womb, in their birth. And they did not get along. And Jacob stole the birthright or from Esau, depending on whose side you're on. Um, and then Jacob goes on to have the 12 sons with the 12 tribes of Israel. And Esau went on to have descendants called the, the nation of Edom, the Edomites. And just as the twins didn't like each other, the nations didn't like each other and were they were, they were neighbours at tension for 1,500 years. And uh, there's a special sense of pain that God's people have now because when the Babylonians came... And this is recorded in Obadiah the prophet, but also in Ezekiel and Jeremiah. When the Babylonians came, the Edomites laughed at God's people and they mocked and they helped the Babylonians destroy Jerusalem and they thought it was a laugh. They were very cruel, very vindictive, and the pain of that still stings God's people. Interestingly, the Babylonians went through and destroyed Edom as well. And what God is saying is, you see my love because because of my choice of you, because of my divine election on you, you're still alive. You're being rebuilt. You've been resurrected. And yet Edom is just a wasteland. And it's not going anywhere. And so God's election is a key to God's love because it means that nothing can stop, nothing can separate you from the love of God if he's chosen you, if he's foreknown you, if he's elected you. And what's true of God's people, what's true of Jacob and Israel is true of the New Testament church. You are chosen by God. You are foreknown, you are predestined, you are elected by God's love. Famously, the the best place to start with this idea is Ephesians 1. For God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. In love, God chose you even before you were born. You know, we chose Jesus because he chose us and willed in good pleasure, in love, that we would, by repentance and faith, be adopted as God's children. And that is an eternal identity we now have forever. We will walk in God's love forever. So I think the encouragement is, if you feel shaken, if you feel threatened, if you feel, am I going to make it, if you're worried about that, come back to the truth that God loves you, and God loved you before you were born, 
before the creation of the world, God delighted that you would be adopted as a Christian forever. It's very comforting, very comforting. So God is saying, don't fear Edom. Just trust my love. Trust my love. But see, the worry is, is that if we can rebuild, what if Edom rebuilds? In fact, they're promising to rebuild. Uh, Malachi says, Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. If Edom rebuilds, then they know the first thing they will do is get Israel again. And they're scared. In effect, what, what's happening here is that um, it's what, what theologians call an eschatology, a series of beliefs you have about the future that carry you through and bring you hope. And so an eschatology is a story you tell that one day everything will be made right and you'll be safe and happy forever. And God's people are threatened by the eschatology of this other nation because everyone has an eschatology. You know, one day I'm going to own a boat and be happy. You know, that's an eschatology. One day I'm going to get married and have 11 kids and it's going to be fantastic. You know, that's an eschatology, a series of hopes that make everything right, that carry you through suffering. And God's people, instead of believing in the promises of God and their own God-given eschatology of the future, they're listening to the eschatology of their neighbours. Well, what, even an unbeliever has a series of beliefs, a vision of the future that carries them forward. Sometimes at um, funerals, you hear, even non-Christian funerals, you hear the kind of blind optimism or the wishful thinking that there's something, something better, they've gone to a better place. Eschatologies are good because they get us through life, they get us through grief. But what matters is really, is our eschatology true? Does it come from God? And God is saying, their eschatology is not true. Don't be threatened by it. They may build, but I will demolish, says the Lord. They'll be called the wicked land. I'll just expose them for who they are. You know, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. I've chosen, I, I, I've chosen, I haven't elected them. I haven't chosen not to have mercy on them. They, they get justice, which is God's wrath and punishment. You'll see it with your own eyes and say, and here's the hope, here's a little bit of eschatology for God's people. One day, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. Well, I wonder if you are ever scared of the dreams of unbelievers. I, I, I always pick on this song, but it's worth picking on because people still like it, that John Lennon Imagine is an eschatology about how one day he thought the hippies would take over and will get rid of the Christians. That's really what that song is about. I know it's very nice, it's very sweet, um, but when he says, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try, no religion too, the dominant religion of England in the 1960s or early 70s was Christianity. John Lennon hated Christianity. And he's saying, you know, what his eschatology is, if only we can just become hippies and strum our guitars and hold hands and practice free love and get rid of nations and religions, things that divide, the world will live as one. And do you see how there's sort of, there's a, there's a peace to that, but it's also a threat. It's like, oh yeah, you've got to get rid of Christians to do that. There's a similar thing happening today, I think, in our society, there is a secular eschatology, and it doesn't really matter what, this is not political, but there's a sort of general current of get on the right side of history. Christian values are gone. Secular values are the future. And so when they say get on the right side of history, it's a threat. They're saying submit to our eschatology or we will get you. You know, change your values or we will cut our funding to your schools and we will tax you and we will find ways to snuff you out. You know, that's a secular eschatology coming true. It's easy to be rattled by that. But don't be rattled. Like Malachi is saying, don't be rattled by the dreams of the Edomites. 
They're going nowhere. They're going nowhere. We are the ones who have the promises of God. We are the ones who have a future. The great missionary, William Carey, uh, kicked off this revolution of global missions in the 18th, 19th century. He said, our future is as bright as the promises of God. Our future is as bright as the promises of God. Don't be scared of other people's plans to get you. You know, he's really saying like that psalm, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. The future of Edom is not greater than the future of God's chosen people. And that is why when you get to Jesus and John the Baptist in the New Testament, you never hear about Edom because it doesn't survive. It doesn't rebuild. It just fades away from Malachi's time onwards. However, Malachi predicts an eschatology where Jesus comes and he has come and he has died and risen for our sins. And so our future is bright. Revelation 7. Here is a Christian eschatology. Here is our hope. A picture of heaven. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, even more than in Casey, from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb, Jesus They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice and compare this to the insipid worship of the the people in Malachi's time, half-hearted and lukewarm, but with a loud voice in heaven, salvation belongs to our God and to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That is our future. That is our eternity. When Jesus rose from the dead, it was God's way of saying, This is the future, resurrection from the dead in this man. God brought eschatology forward into into real history. And in Jesus' resurrection, every other eschatology is proved wrong. Here is the way to eternal life. Here is someone who has defeated sin, who has defeated death. Jesus is risen from the dead. No more wishful thinking required. No more blind optimism necessary. And even no more um, needing to dream about your vision and crushing other people. In the name of Jesus, we go now to the ends of the earth, to every nation, tribe, people and language, and we preach the mercy of God through the Lamb. And, And people can come in and be added to the number, to the great number. Well, Friends, that is our future. But let's draw these threads together. Malachi is a great book. It it addresses us, I think, at Berwick Anglican Church. It's possible to lose connection with the love of God, to lose to stop delighting that you've been chosen by God. Even in a church where it looks good on the surface, and it looks good in Malachi's day as well. You know, it's possible to look good on the surface but in your hearts be lukewarm and to lose the wonder of God's love, the wonder of being chosen by God. So don't forget that God chose you in Christ before the creation of the world. That is why you're here today. That's your past. Don't forget your future, that all things will be placed under his feet, that he will reign eternally in a new creation as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, And we will join the multitudes worshipping him, the forgiven multitudes. God says to us today, I have loved you. We are loved, chosen, with a great future. Let's thank him. Heavenly Father, fill us with the Holy Spirit of confidence and joy and conviction about your love this day. Don't let us be content with half-heartedness and uh, weak discipleship. Build us up uh, in our commitment, in our joy that we are chosen by you and that our future, our eternity is rock solid in the resurrection of your son. Amen.